Hopefully that was good enough. Um, hello, I'm Ryan, uh, Ryan Emerson. I'm not Josh for all the folks in Screenland. Hello, um, not Josh today. Um, but um, I'm just here to share something that God's put on my heart. So I um, just want to pray for a second. God, thank you so much for this time. Um, and just ask that your Holy Spirit just move and just be with us and highlight things and help us to grow closer to you. Amen. Um, so um, I grew up in the church. I had loving Christian parents. I had loving people around me at church and at five. I talked to my dad and we prayed that Jesus would come into my heart. That's the language, I guess, that we used. And and then I lived happily ever after, because that's how it goes, right? Um, no. Um, things get harder, you know, the more you press into God sometimes. Uh, but there's also a lot more joy and freedom and love. And I wanted to start with a little story that my mom likes to share uh, from when I was really little. I was only maybe about two years old. And we were going grocery shopping, and my mom took me. And it was winter time, so I had my little winter coat and my hat and my mittens, and I was pretty cute, I'm sure. Um, and when we got there, she just had me sitting in the shopping cart, and it got boring. Apparently, she uh, was buying this block of nice cheddar cheese that she wanted to use, and I wanted to hold it. So she said I had to be very careful with it. So it didn't fall. So I was holding on pretty tight, you know, like, oh, this is cool. I'm careful not to let it drop, you know. It's the guardian of my new little treasure here. And this was a long shopping trip. And so apparently just holding on to the cheese wasn't enough. So the cheese, you know, is shrink wrapped in plastic and it just had this nice texture. I don't know if you guys have ever just noticed the texture of a good block of cheddar cheese. So I was just kind of pushing into it, squish, squish. Um, you know, I hadn't found bubble wrap yet, so this, this cheese was it. This was the thing. And so I think I, I just, it took her a bit to notice, but when she did see what I was doing, she wasn't happy. Um, she didn't want her block of cheddar looking like Swiss cheese, so she put it in the main part of the cart with the other groceries, and she told me, you know, don't touch it. So she was browsing the shelves for something and turns back. And there I am, she caught me. I was lowering my mitten on its little string, down, 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 and touching the cheese with the mitten. <laughs> and I was looking right at her as I did it, like, uh, this isn't my hand, this isn't touching, right? <laughs> and this is me at two, so now you know a little bit about me. Um, that's the kind of person I am, apparently. Um, so I want us to think about, like, is there a character in the Bible that you've identified with? Uh, maybe you've liked one of the things that they did. You thought it was just either a really cool story or you wanted to be like them. You know, and there's David and Goliath. That's pretty awesome. You know, there's Daniel and the lion's den and, you know. Um, maybe you could relate, relate to somebody's weaknesses, you know, like Gideon. He just had a lot of anxiety, a lot of nervousness. Um, you know, Moses, he was afraid of public speaking. And, you know, and then there's Peter who's like just blurting out whatever he's thinking and... Phew, that always goes well. <laughs> um, but maybe you've related to something wrong they did too. Like, you know, the disciples running and hiding when Jesus gets taken. Or King Saul uh, giving in to the people to keep them happy instead of following God. Um, or King David committing adultery. Or who knows? There's so many. Um, so... Now, I know there's this normal way we do things here at New Beginnings Church, and it's normally to look at a very specific passage, um, and we just kind of work out of that usually, and that's great, and I love it, and that would be great, but today I wanted to look at more of a group of people in the Bible, um, which means we'll be looking at several passages, so um, just bear with me on that, and I'll try and give most of the references, uh, try to prepare that, but we'll see what happens. So... Now, as we're going through Acts, as Josh pointed out earlier, uh, we've been looking lately at the person of Paul because he's kind of the main character. He's the central character in that later half of the book of Acts as the gospel goes from Jerusalem out into Judea and, and into the Roman world. Um, and so it's a pretty important deal. 
Um, and, you know, God does some amazing things with Paul. You know, he authors a large chunk of the New Testament, all those letters to the churches. Um, you know, there's that story where he has those small pieces of cloth that he touched, and when they were taken to other sick people in another place where he wasn't, uh, they would still heal people. And there were other parts of the early part of his life that when I looked at, I could also relate to as well. Now, like most Christians, I grew up reading the Gospels and thinking, oh, here's the Pharisees. These guys are clearly the bad guys. They were called out repeatedly by Jesus in many parts of the Gospels for different issues. They were against Jesus, and eventually they were involved in murdering him. Obviously, they're the villains of the story. So it was weird because when I was in my teens, I heard a speaker say something that just really like stuck with me. And I haven't really been able to shake it since. He said that he, too, used to think that only bad things about these Pharisees were true. And then he started taking a closer look. For some reason, he could relate to them. He even felt he did the exact same things that they were doing. And at the time, I'd been so used to them being the villain that I didn't see any of myself in that. Hearing him say that... Like, what? You're like the Pharisees? That was like as shocking as if they, he said, like, I feel like Darth Vader sometimes, you know? Like, I'm ready to kill people. Um, but, you know, I was left with that question, like, am I a Pharisee? Am I like them? What's going on? Now, Paul mentions being a Pharisee quite a bit as part of his testimony. And the speaker I heard said he identified with the Pharisees. So I needed to look at them, look into it. Who are they? Could I possibly be one? And in the Bible, we see the Pharisees show up for the first time in the Gospels, just before Jesus' ministry, in the time when John the Baptist was preparing the way. And John the Baptist is not happy when they come around um, because basically he calls them out for, you know, you're just showing up. You're not really here for the right reasons. Um, So I'm going to give just a teeny bit of a history lesson here about the Pharisees, just to give some context, because I think it'll pay off as we continue to look into them. So some researchers and scholars think that the seeds of what became this group known as the Pharisees started about 600 years before Jesus was born. So to give it some Bible context, this is when Jerusalem is getting sacked the first time. Solomon's temple is destroyed by the Babylonians, and they're taken into exile and into captivity for approximately 70 plus years. And The Bible reports of these events at the ends of the books in Jeremiah, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and it kind of carries on through several other books like um, Daniel and Esther uh, during the time of captivity and then the beginning of Ezra as well. And so it's a huge pivotal event. In fact, it's something that really just can't be ignored. Um, And the Jews who were exiled to this foreign country wanted to honor God. But they no longer had their temple, and they no longer had their way of doing the normal animal sacrifices that they'd been used to. And so they started creating ways um, to honor God and follow after him still and pass those down. And from historical records that we have now, the Pharisees, you know, more officially as a movement, didn't gel until a little bit later, a little bit closer to the time of Christ. Um, So the Bible actually has a silent period of about 400 years between the Old and New Testament. Uh, It starts, you know, a little bit before 400 B.C. And it was during this time that Alexander the Great, a Greek, he invaded the Persian Empire and eventually he conquers the known world. And this included Israel. So um, you probably know this from like history or whatever, but he died young. Like he did this in a couple years and then... And so four of his generals ended up carving up the empire, Alexander's big one empire, into, you know, each of they each had their own. So there was four different kingdoms with four different generational dynasties of kings or emperors that carried on for many generations. And Israel during this time happened to be between two of these, two of these great Greek empires. And so it was disputed territory because it was right on the fringe. It was right between them, like between the jaws of a lion. So one of the empires was based around in Egypt to the south of Israel, and they had control early on. 
and they were actually tolerant of the Jews' religious practices. But then eventually the other dynasty from the north and east that controlled what we now call Syria, well, when they got control under that second empire, things changed. The policy of toleration was no longer because the emperor who rose to power during this time, it was about 175 BC before Christ, he, he didn't care about the Jews. He stole from Jerusalem's rebuilt temple treasury and he funded his own war against the other kingdom, the Egyptian kingdom, and he took bribes and let someone get the high priest position. He just let them buy the position of high priest for the, for the Jews. Um, this person who bought it was pro-Greek and they called this being Hellenized if you were like into the Greek culture. And to explain just briefly how bad this was to the Jews, like this guy, like they end up building a gymnasium, that's a Greek thing, right next to the temple. It's like a power play. And in the gymnasium, like the thing back then was that you had to go in naked and apparently that was, you know, against Jewish custom law, whatever you want to call it. It was really bad. Um, and then it got worse because they forced everybody, you had to go visit this gymnasium. So it basically was this political thing where, you know, if you wanted any kind of power or wealth or whatever, you had to do this. And this wasn't sitting well with the people, but then it got worse because the emperor, he just really wanted his name to be big, like Alexander's was. And he felt like the only way that he would get well-known over time is that, you know, we got to stamp out this little fringe movement known as the Jews. So he ends up actually setting up uh, their own Greek uh, idols, as we would call them, but their own Greek gods in the temple. And he was sacrificing to them, and it was just... The people were fed up. And then he went into the countryside and started making people in the towns sacrifice to the Greek gods. And that's when things, basically, they, they revolted. So ah, that's, that uh, we call it now the Maccabean Revolt, was actually where we get the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. So you might have maybe heard about this. So basically, that's when they recapture the countryside and then Jerusalem and then rededicate the temple and they almost run out of oil but they don't in the lamp in God's temple and so it was a, considered a miracle and so they have a festival now to celebrate it so that actually is when the movement of Pharisees seems you know again they didn't call themselves that but that's when it seems to have started, right after this revolt, when the Jews are trying to rededicate themselves to God and his ways and like, you know, get rid of the Greek control and the Greek ways, like we got to get rid of that. So by the time of Jesus, you know, um, oh, by the way, in order to keep the Jews free from Greek control during that time, this, I just thought it was interesting that they, they get help from Rome who does help them briefly and then leaves and then comes back about 100 years later and takes control themselves. Um, so by the time of Jesus, the Pharisees are just, they're a religious, uh, they're one of the main groups of religious influencers in Jerusalem, along with Sadducees and scribes, teachers of the law. And they're mentioned repeatedly in the Gospels. You've probably heard of them. There's other groups around at the time like the Essenes, who we got the Dead Sea Scrolls from, but the Gospels really focus in on these certain groups, and there are reasons. Um, but just, just to take a step back and say, like, what, how did the Jews view the Pharisees? They, they really they made some real contributions, I think. Um, some of the Pharisees' biggest contributions to Judaism was that they emphasized this oral tradition, not just the scriptures, but this way of like practicing. Um, they extended Jewish practices into life outside the temple. They instilled a greater devotion to God and the common people, and they promoted a belief in the afterlife. And it is actually the teachings of one of the most prominent Pharisees around Jesus's time named Hillel that much of modern rabbinic Judaism is based on. So it wasn't like it was all bad. Um, so, Again, what kind of people made up the Pharisees? Um, 
So just so you have an idea, too, of the kind of people they were, um, some Pharisees might have been part of the governing class, probably were, but most Pharisees were actually just subordinate officials, bureaucrats, judges, educators, and so on. It's most likely they had a number of different occupations and roles throughout society and were just kind of bound together by these certain beliefs and practices. Like it wasn't just like, hey, here's the, here's the Pharisee building, like the Masonic Lodge or something. It wasn't quite like that. Um, and they weren't a large group either, maybe around 6,000 or so by the time of Jesus. But they were very well respected and they definitely had influence in Jerusalem and Judea. And just to fast forward a bit, you know, the Sadducees, just real quick, um, they were the wealthy people. They believed only in the first five books of the Bible, the ones authored by Moses. They denied all the other and what we would call books in the Old Testament and the oral traditions, and they took a very literal view of everything. They looked at what they could see and prove, what we might now call materialists, and they denied the spiritual stuff like the afterlife, the angels. And that belief system appealed to the wealthy of the day. But the teachings of the Pharisees were actually very popular with the masses, and they held sway there. And we get this from actually a famous Jewish historian, Josephus. You may also remember Jesus deals with those scribes and teachers of the law, and those were actually just like professions. You know, a teacher of the law was a professional term for what we might call now a Bible scholar. Uh, they were the people that helped interpret uh, the scrolls that they had. And scribes were people that we might call lawyers. They would draft legal documents, and so every village had at least one scribe, and so What's interesting is that what we see is that while the scribes and the teachers of the law sometimes came and disagreed with Jesus or tried to argue with him, uh, you know, sometimes they ended up agreeing with him or just walking away going, oh, we can't really argue with this. But the main ones who were upset really were the Pharisees. The Sadducees were also upset because it was threatening their control, but especially the Pharisees. So if I look at this so far, and I just look at myself, I'm not much like the Sadducees. I'm certainly not rich. I believe in the afterlife. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I am middle class, though, which is basically what most of the Pharisees were like. So they actually did a lot of good, and the people generally were on their side and held them in very high regard. So what was it that made them bad? Well, Paul says that in Acts 25, 6, we just saw, I think, last week, that he calls them the strictest sect of our religion, meaning the Jewish faith. And Jesus in Matthew 23, 3 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the most important matters of the law, or the more important, I apologize, more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So these Pharisees, they were focused on the rules, like tithing. You know, I know about tithing. I mean, I've heard about that. Then the Pharisees were making sure they tithed or gave a tenth of every last thing, even their smallest little garden, garden herbs, even if it was just like a little pot. Um, but Jesus said they were forgetting more important matters. And so I'm not sure yet if I can relate to that. So then I actually remembered a time near the beginning of my marriage to my lovely wife over 20 years ago when we were reading the Bible together and we were in Genesis and there was something she didn't quite understand. And I knew about it. I'd heard about this. So I just explained it to her. But she doesn't seem to get it, or really what happens is she, you know, that's what I thought at the time, she was just struggling with it. So I told her again, you know, because I know, and possibly I was a little bit more forceful, possibly with a tone that wasn't as kind. You, you <laughs> might see where this is going, it sounds like. So fast forward just a few more minutes, and I am frustrated. She's in tears, and we had to stop. So... Yeah, going real well so far. <laughs> and she didn't want to talk about it later that day, probably because she could tell I was still like tense and whatever, and she didn't want to talk about it the next day. And so like a few days later, I bring it up again, and she's like, oh, yeah, our pastor at the time, he's explained that to me. 
wait, what? <laughs> I hadn't even known they talked. And she tells me what he said, and I'm like, but, but that's the exact same thing I told you. Yes, and she's like, but he explained it. <laughs> and I was thinking, I had explained it, but somehow I hadn't. And you know, I realized later that she meant that probably he did it nicely and patiently and answered her questions rather than repeating what he'd already said and getting frustrated. But, you know, at the time I'd been focused on explaining what was the truth. But somehow I was losing sight of more important things like kindness, gentleness, patience, and self-control. So somehow there was more of the dark side in me than I really wanted to acknowledge. You know, Darth Vader, you know, he's known for the impatience and the anger and the choking and the insistence on being right. And, the, you know, suddenly that's hitting a bit closer to home. And suddenly that dangling mitten seems a little bit more rebellious than innocent. So the Pharisees, with their insistence to Jesus and his disciples, you know, they had their things like, you know, we've got to wash our hands. And that actually came from the time of being exiled into Babylon and brought back. Like it wasn't something that was originally in their traditions, but now it was. They also had a thing about not healing on the Sabbath, which was, again, their interpretations of the scripture about Sabbath based on oral tradition again. And their insistence on being right was making a little too much sense. And I'd also found out that the, the Pharisees later on are part of the believers as well. It's not like this suddenly just died out. Um, like in Acts 15.5, which we're not going to go into it exactly at this moment, but it clearly mentions some believers that are also part of the Pharisee group. Um, so since Paul was a Pharisee, I think he had some unique ways and insights into just dealing with the heart and the sin issues that Pharisees faced. In fact, I think the insight, that his insight into the way transformation takes place is good no matter what struggles we're facing. Um, I got this next little thing from Pastor Brian Hedges. He's a pastor that I've heard. Um, I've never been to his church, but he noted that throughout Paul's writings, we see a pattern of three elements that seem like, like key ingredients you need to have the kind of life transformation that's our inheritance as believers. So I think these three ingredients you can find in Jesus's life and ministry and teachings as well. And so, in fact, you know, I guess I've heard, and I, I do believe this, that if our theology isn't rooted in the person of Jesus, that part of God that was seen and heard, then we might need to re-examine it. So the, the three parts I'm about to share, they don't work so well apart from each other. And you might remember from school the idea of like a Venn diagram, which is like you take these circles about topics or whatever, and you have them overlap. And where they all overlap, that's the, that's the point where the big stuff happens, where everything's coming into sync. And I think these are like that. It's like a recipe for a cake, that if you leave out the sugar, it might look like a cake, but it's not going to taste right. So these three parts, the three ingredients I just want to touch on today are identity, desire, and habits. So that's identity, desire, and habits. And we need all three for that transformation. So let's start with ingredient number one, identity. So when we look at Jesus and what he says about the Pharisees, like his biggest criticism that he repeatedly calls out the Pharisees for is hypocrisy. In Luke 2, 1, it says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. And if we remember, yeast stood for sin. And he says, that is hypocrisy. That's the thing to guard yourself on. So you probably know this, but the dictionary says that hypocrisy is the practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform, pretending to be something you aren't. And in Luke 12, this isn't the only time, of course, that Jesus calls them out. Um, you know, he calls them hypocrites quite a bit. In Matthew 23 alone, he does it six different times. They are pretending to be something that they aren't. And you may have heard this as well. Maybe not, I don't know. But that word hypocrite in that time 
Uh, it wasn't originally what, how we know it. It actually just meant an actor or a stage player. And this is where it gets interesting. This is not a Jewish word. It's actually a Greek word that the Jews used. So you remember how that at the start, the Pharisees are all about fighting against Hellenization or that incursion of Greek culture into the Jewish way of life and especially into their religious practices. And now we have Jesus's most often used word for the Pharisees and their main sin is a Greek word. To the Pharisees, I mean, they knew what they were, what he was doing. Those were fighting words. So what I found interesting was that the Greek word hypocrite um, is actually a compound noun. It means it's coming from two words that literally translate as an interpreter from underneath which sounds really weird and bizarre until you know that actors in Greek theater, um, the way they would do their plays was that they would wear masks. That was how all the characters were. So they could change between them and they could change between emotions and so forth. And you might've even seen this in theater sometimes where they have the different masks that they show like a sad one or a happy one or whatever. Um, so in spiritual terms, what was going on, I would define that wearing that mask, taking on that role, is to cover up aspects of ourselves that we deem unsightly, that we don't like. And we can all wear different masks or even multiple ones at the same time. So where was the Pharisees' identity? What mask were they wearing? In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus says of them, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So where was their identity? It was focused on the law and the written law and the oral law, the ones the traditions passed down. You know, they were arguing about what work on the Sabbath meant and why you couldn't heal. They argued about eating with those unwashed hands, uh, the disciples. They were focused on what was right by law. And we sometimes call this legalism. But I think if we take a slightly wider focus, we can see this category that legalism falls under is really about being a perfectionist. Somebody who tries to prove their worth and value by attempting to do things perfectly. And it makes you evaluate everything through that lens of like, is this right? Am I right? Are they right? I mean, it's all about being right. And in the Pharisees' case, they tried to do everything right according to the law. But that's not enough. I mean, in Matthew 5, 20, Jesus explains, For I tell you that unless your righteousness, which really just means your right way of living with God, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So here they are focused on being right, and it's not enough. And as Paul explains in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Like there's no way to ever be that 100% perfect all the time for us mortals who aren't Jesus. Paul, raised as a Pharisee, calls out that behavior of trying to do everything right. He sometimes calls it works, like in Galatians 2.16. He says, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. You know, there are a lot of masks we can wear. I mean, I could list off a few common ones that I've seen many a time as a counselor um, because that's what I do for a living. Um, I'm a mental health counselor. You know, there's people pleasing, there's rescuing, achieving, controlling, being the victim, the abuser, the entertainer, the escaper. I mean, these are all different ways we can try and get our identity and our sense of worth. And I dabbled in a lot with these masks, but to be honest, I, I felt I most often struggled with the perfectionist, that need to be right, which was the sin of the Pharisees. So I love water. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey until I was 18, and we had lots of trips to the beach, the ocean, 
uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Our Christian summer camp, in fact, it was in middle school and high school that I went to, was at a place right on the beach. And I loved being in the ocean. And I would sometimes come out only because we had to leave or because the water was so cold that I would be shivering and be like, ah, I got to take a break. But I loved it. I loved the water. And several years ago, I got into fishing. I had a friend that got me into fishing. And I'd done some of it growing up, but really next to none. I mean, my dad wasn't really into that. And so there was this lake in Oskaloosa, where we lived at the time, that I really enjoyed going to. But fishing from the edge of the lake wasn't always easy, especially as the weather heated up. In the heat of the summer, the fish would all go to the central part of the lake. And you couldn't get there just by being on the edge. I couldn't cast that far. So with some birthday money one year, I decided to get a fishing kayak. And I loved it. I mean, I was out on the water. I was fishing again. I was catching things again. You know, I love being on the water. I love the feel of it. But then I kind of noticed that, you know, honestly, you know, a fishing kayak is kind of flat at the bottom, which makes it, you know, more stable if you're leaning a little bit to fish. But it also makes it harder to steer. And so I did some research, and I learned about this thing called a rudder. So my boat didn't have it. Most kayaks don't unless you add it on or unless they're an ocean kayak. And so I got a rudder, and I looked for some ways to attach it. And the best way actually was to have pedals for your feet. So you could, you know, you could use your arms because in a kayak you're using that one big thing with both arms, the one big paddle. And, you know, or you're fishing if you're in a fishing kayak sometimes. And so you want to have the control for the rudder with your feet. But, you know, I looked at what I had and the boat I had and the way I saw, like online, I looked some stuff up on YouTube. It wasn't, their boats weren't the same as mine. My, they had some kind of paddle thing and like, I just, I didn't know how to make it work. I mean, I didn't want to guess at this. I didn't want to just try something. I like to know how to do it. I like to get it right. And so unfortunately, it's been a few years since I've taken my kayak out on the water. You know, I still love the water, but because I couldn't find the best way, right now, oftentimes my boat just sits in the garage with, with its nice rudder right next to it, collecting dust. You know, in fact, the more I look at my life, the more I could actually see this wasn't an isolated event about the kayak. You know, this was a clear pattern. As a teen, you know, I remember getting interested in tennis and I took lessons that my parents paid for and they were like, yeah, you're doing well, you know, but I wasn't sure. I saw some of the other players. I wasn't sure I was good enough. So I, you know, regret this, but at the time I made the decision not to even try out for the high school team. Or, you know, I remember my first job, you know, I was probably 14, 15 at the time. I had trouble with it. I really enjoyed this job because I liked reading, I liked books, and I was at the library. But I was kind of a talker at the time and so got in trouble for that. And, you know, instead of a warning, they just decided to fire me. So for a long time, I actually stopped looking for work that I enjoyed and just kind of did work that paid okay. You know, I could see this pattern in my spiritual life, too, you know. I would read my Bible. I'd try to read through the Bible. I'd try to witness or teach or lead a small group or, you know, all those Christian things. Fill in the blank. Because this really ended up happening, I think, way too many times in my life. It was a pattern. If I hit a snag, if I made a mistake, if I didn't get it right early on, or if I got disappointed by the results and I didn't feel I could get it right, or if I was even just unsure I could get it right, more often than not, I stopped doing it or just didn't try because being right had become my focus, you know? You know, this also meant, and I remember doing this too, unfortunately, more than just with my wife. This was a pattern too sometimes for a while um, where if I got questioned for what I thought was the right answer, especially if it had to do with the Bible, that's, oof, I got prickly, I got defensive, I got easily upset, snappy, irritable, cranky, whatever you want to say. <laughs> you know, but I mean, God was merciful. He would help me circle back to things and keep trying things. But, you know, oftentimes I would just get afraid to make mistakes or admit to somebody else that I had made a mistake or that I needed help. 
So I didn't ask for any. And eventually I'd hit that point where I couldn't keep going on alone. And trying to research on my own wasn't enough without consulting someone who knew what they were talking about. So, you know, if I had to take off that mask, that, that wasn't a possibility, so I sometimes quit. Do you remember wearing masks like real, you know, like masks like a Halloween costume or something? Because I do. And, you know, the thing I remember most is that they're very uncomfortable. Like under a mask, you get hot, you get sweaty. You know, we even had, I remember for Halloween, I think Jerry Seinfeld did a bit about this, but like those plastic stamped out ones that had like a superhero face or something on it. It had like the little elastic rubber bands stapled on either side. And those things would just like, you know, the eye holes were just punched and they just dig right into your eyes. And so like wearing them for any length of time was just super uncomfortable. You mean, I also remember you couldn't see well. I remember tripping. I mean, why bother with these these things, like that's what I said. Like when it came to costumes, I eventually just gave up on masks. But in my life, you know, that mask of perfection was still there. Why would I do that to myself? Um, as Brene Brown says, and this is somebody I learned about through counseling, um, she says, we are wired to be part of something bigger than us so deeply that sometimes we will take fitting in as a substitute. But actually, fitting in is the greatest barrier to belonging because fitting in says, be like them to be accepted. Belonging says, this is who I am. You know, to fit in, we have to stop being ourselves and pretend to be something else. We wear a mask. But what we really want, what we actually want is to belong, to be accepted, you know? Jesus knew about belonging. In John 5, 19, Jesus, when being very persecuted by the religious leaders for healing a man on the Sabbath, said, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. You know, we see Jesus knowing his true identity. We see him going to the cross, despising its shame. He goes against the crowd. In fact, he actually deliberately seems to provoke things, like with the Pharisees, to challenge bad beliefs of his day. He was not doing things to fit in. But where does he get that solid belief in his identity? I think we get a clue, a glimpse in Matthew 3.17. This is, you know, in Jesus' uh, ministry and stuff, this is actually before all that. This is when Jesus gets baptized by John before he ever does a miracle or preach or anything else that says, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Jesus knew that he was loved before he faced those temptations and did his ministry and before he died on the cross. His identity as God's son was solid in that love. Paul explains in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God loves us. Paul expands, though, on this because, like, what kind of love is this? Like, is this, I love cheeseburgers kind of love? Like, what are we talking here? He says, but when the set time, hello? <laughs> Just messing with it? Okay, sorry. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship, because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave to sin, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. So sonship, God sees us as family, like his own kids. He doesn't see the sinful identity. He sees Jesus. And I've been living out this identity of the perfectionist quite a bit. The one who tries to be right, 
the one who tries to be good enough. I mean, I was a firstborn kid, you know, I'm looking up to my parents and I think for a lot of firstborns, this is kind of common or a lot of only kids or a lot of people that just had a huge age gap. Um, we can often look to those adults and say, how do I measure up? I better, you know, I got to fit in. But in truth, you know, we're suffocating under the mask of that sometimes. And Jesus invites us all to lay down all of our old masks, all of our old identities that we use to try and fit in. In Matthew 11, 28, 30, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I really liked how author and speaker Brennan Manning famously put it. He would talk and talk about God's love and how much he loved us and how important that was for us to understand. And he said he believed that when we die and stand before Jesus at the final judgment, we would be asked one question and one question only. Jesus would say, did you believe that I loved you? Why? Because that's the question. And how we answer it determines where we get our identity from. So let's look at ingredient number two, desire. Desires your heart, your emotions, your thoughts. I mean, we live in the modern age, a time where we often think of ourselves as mostly rational beings, you know. Because several hundred years ago, Descartes kicked off what we now are calling the age of reason. And he had this famous statement, I think, therefore I am. And this idea that thought was somehow separate from what we might call emotions, that's actually a more modern interpretation on life. It's not how the people who wrote the Bible viewed the world or talked about it. It's actually not even the picture painted by the latest research in science. I mean, I'm not going to go into the details, but... Uh, feel free to ask me about it sometime if you want to know more. But my point is that we are a mix of our thoughts and our emotions. In Bible times, the seat of the thought and emotions was simply called the heart. I mean, they didn't know that the brain was actually the organ of thought, but they knew that emotions caused responses, most often in the chest and gut. And so they believed our thoughts and our passions and our emotions came from the heart. So that's how they talk about it. And we don't always like to admit it, but our emotions actually play a huge role in all of our choices. I mean, if it wasn't true, advertising really wouldn't exist. It would just be a few boring statistics pasted on to a label. But that's not what it is. I mean, you think about those commercials, like for the deodorant that shows someone being successful, like, oh, I'm a race car driver suddenly, or I'm great at social events, or I, I get the girl, or whatever. I mean, does deodorant make you a better driver rationally or better at conversation with the opposite sex or anything like that? I mean, no, no way. Rationally, there is no logic behind that. But emotionally, if our brains make that connection, even when it's a lie, we want that product. So what is our desire fixed on? Our heart, our thoughts, our emotions, both. Um, a previous pastor of mine liked to have us look at the three T's, this is Pastor Bill, and he would regularly ask us, where are you spending your time, your talents, and your treasures? Your time, your talents, and your treasures. He said, one way to think of it is to imagine that someone who doesn't know you, doesn't know your culture, like an archaeologist from a, the distant future, maybe even an alien, came to our world and just looked at what you left behind. What would they think if they came into your house and looked around at the things you have and they saw your bank statements and how you spent your money, they saw your calendar or your phone, where you spent your time. I mean, what would they guess about you? What would they think that you desired? For instance, they might come upon this room where everything points to this one thing. Like, is this a religious room? Is this some kind of altar over here? Is this I mean, what's on it looks kind of bright and shiny. Are these like offerings they leave on the altar? I mean, what are they looking at? I mean, well, it's my living room. They see all the chairs pointed at my television. They see my entertainment center with all the DVDs and the video games that are on it. 
and they're like, they might guess wrong. What if they looked in my garage and saw how much money I'd invested in my boat and my fishing supplies and rods and baits and tackles and all the stuff to store them? And would they think I'm some like great fisherman who's always out on the water? Or, you know, the truth is, like, I've only been out a handful of times in the past few years because, like I said, I got too worried about getting it right with the rudder to just enjoy my boat. Jesus in Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Maybe we could say, have that same person look at our calendar. What if they had a record of how much time I spend on the electronic devices I have? I mean, what would they think? I mean, I can imagine this. Like, they're looking to see, like, okay, there's this thing called Facebook or TikTok or YouTube or all of those fun things, or maybe it's the video games or the TV shows, and they might wonder, I mean, okay, so here they are, they're wondering like, okay, how many minutes a day did they spend on this? Wait, wait, you just said hours? That that can't be right. Now understand, I'm not saying that some TV, some social media, some hobbies, they're bad. I mean, that's really not at all. Because when first things are first, when our heart is pointed first to God, he can lead us into everything, every kind of situation and meetings of all kinds, things that, you know, defy the, the culture even, just like he did. But what am I doing with my time, my talents, and my treasures? What are they reflecting? What does it say about where my heart is pointed? Paul in Colossians 3, 2 through 4 says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And Hebrews 12, 2, which may or may not have been written by Paul, tells us even more clearly that as we run the race, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, because what we set our sights on matters. What's primary or first in our heart will play out in our life. I mean, imagine if I'm a pilot and I'm trying to fly from like New Jersey all the way across the country to California, and my instruments are off by even like one degree. Like, the longer I'm traveling one degree off, the farther off course I get. I mean, I don't even end up at my intended destination. I mean, over the long distance, and I might end up in Canada. And if I'm doing target practice, if I'm not aiming for the bullseye, but just kind of the the general area of that target, I mean, what am I going to hit? So when Jesus is what we are locked in on, we become more and more like him every day, but if not. So when I look as a perfectionist with my focus being on what was right, on proving myself right, on knowing I was right, I mean, where did that steer me? I mean, if I look, I see it steered me towards giving up on things I wanted to do, not even trying some of them. I was arguing with who was right and how right they were, getting frustrated and angry in my personal life or in my social situations. I was doing less and less of the God stuff the more I tried to use this this mask, this false identity as my guide. And the more I tried to fit in, the more I felt I actually didn't belong. James, the brother of Jesus, and one of the leaders in the church at Jerusalem reminds us in his book, James, in four, verse four, chapter 4, verse 4, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I mean, if I believe him, I am so off course, I'm becoming an enemy of God. I mean, that, that is like the Pharisees. In counseling, I tell people that anger has many degrees, like on the low end, I might be irritated or frustrated, but as it gets worse and worse, mad, super angry, eventually anger turns into murder, turns into wanting to kill something. If you ever wondered why the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus, they were angry. They weren't getting their way. But at least I didn't have that in common with them, right? At least I'm not a murderer. Except in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus teaches us that what we do in our hearts and our thoughts and our emotions is just as bad as the act. 
In Matthew 5, 22, he says, if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. But if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. I don't have this verse in there, but, you know, he also talks about, like, if you just look lustfully at another person, you're committing adultery in your heart. What we do in our heart does matter. Where our heart is pointed matters a lot. And, excuse me for one second, in Matthew 5, 22, Oh, sorry, just read that one. In James 4, 1 through 3, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. And you don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So my anger at others, I'm not getting my way, I'm getting upset. And when I put them down or curse them, it was like murder in God's eyes. I mean, I wasn't just smearing their name or talking badly or critically about them. I was killing them. You know, I didn't like thinking of myself as a murderer. I really don't. I mean, I like to say things that you might find familiar, like, I just got a little mad. Um, I just sometimes get some road rage, but you should have seen what they did. I mean, I'm not being critical. It's the truth. I just didn't like the way I was treated by my last church. I mean, they hurt me. I should warn people. But all of those things, like the mitten and the cheese, there are always ways to try and get around what somebody said not to do. In this case, what God said not to do. Now, our final transformation ingredient, the third one, is our habits. Again, when I'm in counseling, there's something I like to tell people, that it's not what you do once in a while, or some grand gesture that really makes us or breaks us. It's actually our lifestyle. It's our daily habits, the things we do most days. And you've probably seen results of things like fad diets or New Year's resolutions to exercise that do only last a few days or weeks or even a few months if you're really good at that. Um, And when it doesn't last, it doesn't work. So I tell people to choose habits they can stick with for the long haul. It's better to stick with, say, walking a mile every day, excuse me, than trying to run five miles once a week. I mean... If you didn't have running practice, for me, running five miles would make me sick. And then I'd really want to avoid running. And if I look at the spiritual habits, the same might apply. Better to read your Bible for five minutes every day than try once a week for 30. Better to pray every day than cram as you head to the football game. Paul talks about our getting godly habits in different ways in his different letters. So in Romans 12, he talks about renewing your mind. In Colossians 3, he talks about dying to the old self and clothing yourself in Christ, like putting down, putting on. In Ephesians 5, he calls it following God's example. And in chapter 6, he talks about putting on the armor of God. And in Galatians 5, he talks about walking in step with the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, verses 13 and 14, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use that freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So, he's already talked about loving God. I mean, that's the spiritual habits. But what is this... Habits of loving others. Paul describes in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, what he calls the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And fruit, I mean, that's the product. That's, you know, trees don't just get fruit right away. It's the result of all the rest that's going on. 
It's what Jesus says in Matthew 7 we can use to tell what's on the inside of a person, if it's God or not, which would include what's on the inside of us. It's like a measuring stick. The way we can judge a choice or a habit or an action, if it's good or not, is does it produce God's fruit or not? Is it showing love? You know, I think that the spiritual habits are very good at helping us love God. You know, put your eyes on scripture, reflect on it, meditate, communicate with God, pray, gather together. They also help us love others, pray with each other, sing songs of praise. You know, they are part of loving God. They are part that's necessary. But I think we also need to consider sometimes the habits of love that include loving our neighbors, our coworkers, our communities, and even our enemies. You know, so, you know, maybe not getting like honking on the horn or getting frustrated at the person who cuts us off in traffic or takes that last fry off the tray. Not putting on a mask about how cool we are, but being ourselves. Not always trying to be right or the know-it-all, but letting other people get some credit for knowing some things. Not always taking that spotlight, but letting other people's talk. Maybe it's in giving some of our things to the less fortunate, somebody who doesn't have them. Maybe it's using your times, your talents, and your treasures in other ways that slowly become a love habit. And sometimes having a habit of love even means being our messed up selves, not hiding behind those masks we would wear so easily when we were not yet saved, confessing our sins to each other, telling our testimony, even if it doesn't make us look good. Because then God gets to shine. And God's been doing his work in my life a lot of years, and I'm not wearing the perfectionist mask as often as I once was. I think, you know, under stress, I still definitely find myself sometimes reaching for it and putting it on before I know better. But I think of you know, whenever me and my wife have owned a house, one of my less favorite parts is mowing. And one of my least favorite parts is mowing, to be honest. And for whatever reason, God has often led us to houses with very large yards. And for me, and I'm not saying mowing is bad because some people love it, but for me, mowing is repetitive and that gets boring. And I've learned a few tricks, but for a while, I really just hated it. So I not only had a big yard, but we also had a push mower. So I had like a half acre yard and a push mower. And I would be out sweating for hours. So I would procrastinate and maybe get the, the lawn would get taller. But if I did that, I kind of learned one pass wasn't enough. And so I had to go back over it. So I wasn't a fast learner, but you know. Well, then there was when my oldest boy, who's now 10, he was probably about two or three, and he wanted to mow with me. He could barely reach the push handle, so I got him a toy mower. That satisfied him for like a year, but he kept asking to use that real mower like Daddy. Now, if I let him, I mean, he probably couldn't even do it, but um, things just weren't going to be right, even if I was helping him. I mean, I might have to even redo parts would definitely slow me down. But he persisted, and I think God did too, so that I realized it wasn't about being right or perfect. And eventually, I let him come along. I mean, there he was, and there I was going behind him, and he's barely able to reach. But guess what? You know, he doesn't know that. He loves it. He would really, I mean, I would have let him go longer. By then, I had kind of just come to terms with God that I just needed to let it keep going. Um, but usually he was fine after just a few minutes. That's really all he wanted to do at that age. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, I definitely went slower and I did have to redo occasionally some sections because we might miss some spots as I'm trying to help him. But there was love between us. I think God is the same way in that he's not looking for perfection from us. I mean, if he wanted things done perfectly, he'd do it himself. But God wants us to be part of what he does. He wants us in the family business. So remember that the recipe for transformation that we see and Paul talk about so often has those three key ingredients that 
when you mix them together, they, they make something better than the sum of their parts, than they could just stand on their own. Identity, desire, habits. We need all three. So when you look at your life, do you see transformation? I mean, maybe there are parts of your life that look really good, and then there's other parts, like that secret room in your house that you keep the door closed on when the guests are over. And if you want God's transforming power in your life, which of these three ingredients might you want to have? What might be missing in your recipe? Identity is, do you really believe Jesus loves you? That you're adopted into God's family? That you're the bride of Christ? That he wants you? You're his beloved. I mean, if you don't yet see that, there are a lot of verses that I would recommend reflecting on that talk about God's love for us. I mean, maybe you even have a block to feeling God's love or forgiving yourself or God or other people due to something that's happened to you or something you did. But there is prayer and counsel for that kind of thing. Or maybe the ingredient missing is desire. Like, where is my heart focused? Where am I spending my time, my talents, my treasures? That's where my heart is. Does something need to change there? Are, am I like focused on first things first? Or maybe it's the habits. Am I putting on love daily? Do my habits show I'm loving God and loving others? Like if someone looked at a log of how I behaved, would they come to the conclusion, this is a person who knows God, who loves God and loves others? So we're going to wrap up now. But as always, if you want some prayer, if you just want to talk, if you just want to hang out and have fellowship after church, um, you can do that. If you want to talk more about certain things, certain questions you have, certain things you want prayer for because you don't want to do this alone anymore, um, please just, you can come see me at any time. Um, you can come see Pastor Josh. Um, it's always available. So for now, I'm going to try and do my best. I'm probably going to misword it from how Josh normally does it, but I'm going to say the, the blessing that he likes to end on. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.